Today we are exploring quite possibly one of the most misunderstood and complex concepts in the entire elementary curriculum. We are talking about division. But I would argue that if we could take the time to roll back and really explore division with super friendly numbers, really friendly contexts, for the purpose of deeply understanding how this operator behaves, we would be able to unlock so many other connections and tackle so many other concepts of the elementary curriculum with a lot more understanding and through reasoning. Division is connected to the work that we do in fractions. It's connected to work in proportional reasoning and algebraic thinking. And so it's really worth spending the time on. So I want you to think for a minute about the question, what is division? If I was to walk up to any teacher or any student in your building and I asked this question, how would they answer? I love this question with subtraction as well, and I'll use it as an example while you're thinking about your response. But I always say if I was to walk up to people in a building and I said to them, and particularly students, what is subtraction? The response that I would hear from most is that subtraction is takeaway or removal. And although that is true of subtraction, it's really only one piece of the puzzle. It's only one way that that operator behaves. And if I want to really be able to use subtraction as a tool for thinking, then I need to know what, per, what does it perform? What does it do for us? How do I know when to use that operator? And for sure, the same could be said for division. So I'm asking you to think now and maybe write it down or, or share it with a friend if you're listening along with a colleague or, or someone else is with you right now. And I maybe ask them this question as well. What is division? And many of you may have said something like, well, division is fair share. Division is taking something and it's breaking it into equal parts. And if that is your answer, that is the type of division that we're going to explore today in the first little bit of this episode. But that is only one part, and it's only one way that division actually behaves for us. And so we're going to take some time to really unpack what division does. In the Ontario curriculum under the teacher supports in grades three and four, they're super explicit about division. And they say in simplest terms, there are two types of division problems. And I would argue that that is true for sure in simplest terms. It is not the um, division is not defined, though, by just these two behaviors. And arguably in Van de Waal's book, he mentions that there are essentially four structures for multiplication and division. And maybe in a future episode, we'll be able to dive into the others. But for today, we're going to be looking at these two types, equal sharing division. That's that fair share scenario, as well as equal grouping division or measurement quotative division. So I'm going to start with a, a context for you. And so if you are at home or in your classroom or your office and you have access to a pen or pencil and paper, I would encourage you to actually draw this out, create a visual representation of the context I'm about to explain. If you are driving or jogging, riding your bike right now, and that's not an option for you, just visualize in your mind. The context I'm about to share comes from a Make Math Moments unit called Sowing Seeds. This is day one, and when I wrote this unit, I was in the middle of prepping my garden in the spring, and so planting was on my mind. So I dumped out a pack of seeds, and these are peas, um, to be specific, and I dumped them all out, and I noticed that there were 78 peas altogether. And I had six pots that I could sow these into um, because I was growing my little seedlings at the time. So I wanted to figure out, I wanted an equal distribution of the peas in each pot. So I needed to figure out how many peas per pot. So just to give you that information one more time, you have 78 peas altogether. And when it comes to defining the type of division we're working with, you always want to ask yourself, what do you know and what are you trying to figure out? So in this scenario, we know that there are 78 peas. We also know that there are six pots and we're trying to figure out the number of peas per pot if these are going to be evenly distributed. One thing that I've always kind of 
noticed or recognized about this particular type of division is that typically you have two distinct units. So in this scenario, our dividend is peas and our divisor is pots. And once we actually perform the operator, our result is a compound unit of peas per pot. It's actually a rate. We're trying to reveal this idea of, you know, how many per one, if we thought about this as a ratio. So right now our ratio is 78 peas to six pots. We're trying to, again, and this is our connection to proportional reasoning, we're trying to find the ratio of peas to one pot. And so students might approach this task through just real true fair sharing where they actually take a concrete material, they have 78 of a quantity, and they start to hand them out one P for every pot over and over and over again until they've depleted the entire collection of peas. Some students might be bold and they might be like, you know what, I'm actually just going to put 10 peas in every pot right off the hop because I know there's at least 60 peas here. And then they're going to fair share out the rest. And of course, at the end of the day, we're going to reveal that there are 13 peas per pot. My approach to this task is just slightly different. It's just another way. And again, there's no way that's better than the other. What we want is to have a variety of strategies that we get to choose from. That's our strategic competence. So for me, I imagine that I have all 78 peas and they've yet to be divided. They're all just in one big pile. And I think in my mind, well, what if I split them into two pots? So I take my 78 and I kind of cut it in half. So now I have 39 in, on each side. And then I'm like, well, that's only two pots. I actually need six pots. And so I'm actually going to split that half again into thirds. So I'm going to take the 39 and I'm going to now split it into three parts because I know that a third of a half is a sixth. I can visualize that. So I have 39 and I'm going to divide it by three or find a third of it. And I can reveal that there are 13 peas per pot. So the behavior of this type of division is for the purpose of revealing that ratio to one or revealing that rate with a compound unit. In my class, after engaging in a task like this, I would be super clear around our learning goal, that we are learning to create and solve partitive or fair share division problems. And I might give my students a prompt to reflect on, like today's problem was an example of partitive division. In your own words, explain what that is. Or I might say, you know, create your own problem where you're asked to fair share or use a partitive division, um, similar to the one that we did today with the seeds in the pots. And again, I just really want them to understand that this is one of the ways that division behaves. That was that equal sharing, partitive division scenario. And I just want to reiterate once again, because I know sometimes it's nuanced and it's hard to retain this information. But in that scenario, and if you have a pencil, like write this down, you know, we all know that handwriting is a great way to store things in our memory. But in these equal sharing division scenarios, what is known is the total amount. That's our dividend. In this case, it was the total number of peas. It was 78. What is also known is the total number of parts or groups. So we knew that there were six pots, but what we were trying to figure out what was unknown was the size of each group or the how muchness of each group. We didn't know that there were going to be 13 peas in every pot. So we needed to kind of fair share that 78 equally amongst the number of groups. Okay, so now let's look at the second type. And again, we're just staying really simple today. We're defining division in its simplest term. We're now going to explore equal grouping division or measurement division. This is also called quotative division. Um, lots to choose from. I like partitive and quotative doesn't really matter as long as we can solidify our understanding and articulate that division helps us achieve both of these goals. So we are going to now explore another context. This is from day three of that same unit. So the entire purpose of this sowing seeds unit, 
using super friendly numbers. Like I want to be clear about that and also clear that these units are all intended to be done without the use of a calculator because we really want to position students in a productive struggle where they have to work with the numbers and really understand the relationship with these quantities. So in this second scenario, we're still planting peas, but in this case, we realize on the back of the packaging that there are instructions for planting. So it's like, it tells me how deep I should plant them. And it also tells me the spacing and it's saying, you know, your peas should be planted at least four inches apart, which means I can't overcrowd them in the pot. So what I realize is when I open this pack, I notice that there are 96 peas in this pack. And based on the size of my pot, the, I can only put eight peas per pot. So I want to make sure that I am spacing them out and that is the maximum number per pot. So what I'm trying to figure out in this scenario is that if I have 96 peas and I can put eight peas per pot, my question is, how many pots do I need? So I want you to think again about what do we know and what are we trying to reveal? We know there are 96 peas. That's the total amount, the total quota. We know that we can put eight peas per pot and we're trying to reveal the number of pots. In this scenario, I almost think of the peas as like a single unit and they're clustered in eight. And it's like there are eight in a row and I can't separate those eight. So it's almost like I need to make copies of that eight. And I'm just going to, I can very vividly in this case, see almost that repeated addition of eight. It's like eight plus eight plus eight plus eight until I get to 96. Or similar to our last scenario, I might say, you know, I know right away I need at least 10 pots because there are more than 80 peas here. So 10 pots is going to help me plant 80 peas. And then I just have to deal with the remaining 16. That's going to be two more pots. How is this connected to algebra? And in the title of this slide deck, I talked about, you know, how this work helps us unpack algebraic thinking. And, and, and really, I said, like, this is connected to fractions. It's connected to proportional reasoning. And, and if you stick around for, you know, more episodes on this topic, we'll continue to unpack that. But what I will say is that in both scenarios, we were talking about this idea of revealing an unknown factor. So in our first context, we didn't know the pots. Okay. And if I picture, if I go back to this array representation, in our first scenario, sorry, we didn't, we knew the pots. We knew that it was six pots. So that's kind of like the, the factor in this representation. If you are watching the video right now, you can see it. If you are listening along, I'm going to try to be super descriptive, but essentially, you know, if I think about an array representation, if I picture this as a rectangle in the first scenario, I knew that one of the dimensions was six. So it's almost like the number of rows in my array was six, but I didn't know how many in each row. So that was like the unknown factor. It's like six multiplied by unknown quantity is going to equal 78. Now in our second scenario, and I'm going to try to be super descriptive, knowing some of you are listening along right now, we knew how many were in each row. We knew there were eight. We knew that that relationship, we knew that ratio to one pot. We knew that it was eight peas in every one pot. But what we didn't know was how many rows we had. We were missing the other factor. If I think about this, like a multiplication sentence, it's almost like I have an unknown number of pots multiplied by eight peas per pot, which gave me that total of 96 peas. Okay, so why does this matter? Some of you are probably thinking to yourselves, like, at the end of the day, they're still going to find the answer. But here is the challenge. Context is a super powerful way to support conceptual understanding. 
It's a way for us to actually live and breathe the mathematics and store it to our memory. And if you have students in your class who are students like me, you can tell me to do something a hundred times. You can model the steps for me over and over again, but it's not going to help me understand it and retain it. I need to live it. I need to make sense of it. And so context is an amazing way to do that. But when I give you a context that's fair share, and then I show you a strategy to solve it that's measured, things can get very, very muddy very quickly. I want you to think just for a minute, one moment, about this division sentence. If I told you 100 divided by 4, and I said to you, there's $100 that you're going to divide or share evenly amongst four people. Naturally, in my mind, I picture I have a hundred and I'm splitting it into four parts. It's almost like I'm chopping it. So I have a hundred and I'm going to then, you know, chop it into four equal parts and I'm going to visualize that there's 25 in each part. But what if I gave you that context, but then I gave you a strategy that said how many fours are in a hundred. That looks very different. It's behaving very different. And now it's getting very muddy. So if we want to leverage essentially context as a tool to support really, you know, deep conceptual understanding, to support student retention, to build flexibility, resiliency, reasoning skills, we have to make sure that our context and our strategies and models are matching up. And that's where teacher clarity is so super important to engage in that work. Like I have to be able to look at the problem I'm asking that day and be clear, okay, the context I'm giving them is partitive. So I'm going to want to make sure that my strategies and my modeling matches. The other reason that this is such a powerful work to engage in or why it's worth spending time on, even just starting with these two simplest definitions of division is that as a student, I want them to be able to, in a contextless scenario where they're faced with a naked problem, I want them to be able to say to themselves, 96 divided by 8, how do I want to approach that? Do I want to take 96 and and break it into 8 parts and find out how much per part? That might be intuitive because 8 is super easy to Um, partition because you just have to half, half, and half. So maybe that's what I want to use today. Or do I want to say to myself, how many eights are in 96? And I want to approach it through like this skip counting or partial product strategy. What I want is for students to know that they have that option and have clarity around it. So my son is nine and I'm, I try to be super clear with him when I ask him that question what is division that, you know, at bare minimum at this point in his trajectory, he can articulate, well, division can help me figure out how much per group, if I know how many groups, or if I know how much is in every group, how many groups, or that exactly like I just shared with that 96 divided by eight, that he knows he gets to choose. Do I want to ask myself how many copies of the divisor are in this total or do I want to take the total and break it into that many groups and so that's just kind of a a pitch for why clarity around division is so critically important so at the end of the day I would go into that second task and really that's my goal is clarity I want them at the end of this unit the sowing seeds unit to really understand that there is different behavior and it's based on what we know And what we're trying to reveal. So sometimes we know the number of groups, but we don't know how much per group. And sometimes we actually know how much per group, but we don't know how many groups there are. So I want to give you some homework for everybody listening today to really think about these two behaviors of division. And again, I want to be super clear that this is not, um, it's not limited to these two behaviors. Again, arguably, Van de Waal would suggest that there are four categories for multiplicative behavior, including division, of course. 
But I want you to take the problem 85 divided by 5. And I want you to imagine in your mind a context or a problem that you would give students that would represent 85 divided by 5 in a partitive way. And then how would you approach it? How would you model it for students? What strategy would you use if 85 is the total, 5 is the number of groups you're trying to reveal the part, how much per group. Then I want you to think about 85 divided by 5 and think about it in a quotative context or a measured or an equal grouping kind of scenario, whatever you want to call it. Um, in that scenario, in that quotative context, 85 is the total. 5 is the how much per group. It's the rate. You actually know the quantity. What you don't know is how many copies or how many groups of it you can make. So kind of take the time, do that homework. I wanted to be super clear that this isn't just about early division. It's going to unlock so many connections. And I, I really would argue it is almost um, a gatekeeper for really deeply understanding proportional reasoning and work with fractions. And if you stick around, I'm sure I'll be recording more videos like this one or, you know, more episodes where we will explore how this connects and what this understanding that we're establishing now, what impact it can have later. So what impact it has when students are solving problems with an unknown variable, what impact it has when we're using proportional reasoning to find unknown quantities, and absolutely what impact it has on our understanding of how fractions behave. So I hope that you will kind of keep an eye out for another episode where we talk